So good afternoon and welcome to everybody who has joined us today from wherever in the world you have joined from. We do appreciate your company. Uh, my name is Robin Huggins. I am the Client Services Director for a business called MBN Solutions. We are a talent business specialising in the data space based out of Glasgow. We are also the hosts of this joint venture, Scottish Data Science and Technology Meetup Group, which we run with our good friends, the Data Lab. We've been running now for a number of years. We've got all sorts of members. You're here today. We appreciate your time, and we hope you are here to learn some good stuff. Some house rules before we kick off. As I've mentioned earlier, chat is there for chat. If you want to have a wee conversation, please go for it. Pedro's going to be taking over in a short time from now. If you have questions for Pedro, please try and keep them to the Q&A box. It's much easier for me to dig through them if they're all in Q&A uh, than it is for me to dig through chat and try and find questions. Pedro is going to take over and he's going to be speaking for around about half an hour. Now, I reckon it's just coming up for about 10 past 12. Pedro will be speaking until about 22, and then we're going to do a Q&A session. That Q&A session might be five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, or it might take us up all the way to the top of the hour. Top of the hour is a hard stop. Very conscious that everybody's got lives and lunches and other calls to be joining and all that kind of good stuff. So that's about it from me. I'm going to pass over to Pedro now. I'm going to go dark, Pedro, switch the mic off and the camera off. But I am here and I will be able to jump in and help should there be any challenges or issues. But sir, Pedro, the floor is yours. Good luck, fella. Thanks, Rob. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and and thank you for being around. So I, I'm Pedro Santos. I'm, I'm the lead data scientist at Total Energies UK, uh, part of a bigger team called Digital and Data. Um, I'll be talking to you today about early warning notifications, in particular for industrial equipment. So the problem we had to solve here uh, was to detect failures in industrial equipment um, as early as possible. Um, that this has a, a, a many benefits. Uh, one of them is that if we have more efficient machines, we minimize our CO2 emissions, we reduce the amount of uh, reactive maintenance that we need to, to, that, to do, and we move more to a world where we do more planned maintenance and reactive. Um, and because of all the supply chain effort that goes into that, we optimize the supply chain as well. Um, also, uh, a problem that we have is that sometimes we run with more machines that we actually need for the load that, that we, we need to, to provide. Um, however, to, to run so single points of failure, we need to have some assurance that the models will predict in advance if a machine is going to fail. We want to predict not only failures, but also explaining why. And I'll be talking a bit about uh, the explainable AI that goes around, around this project. And ultimately um, have a full pipeline where we create a work order so that the equipment that has been, um, that, that has deteriorated is then uh, repaired and all the parts are ordered for, for that to happen. So um, what is anomaly detection? So it's actually pretty simple. Um, we, this X here is just an observation at a specific point in time. You can think of it like if we are now uh, 10 past 12, we have uh, measurements for temperatures, pressures, loads, and so on for a machine. Uh, so X is a multi-dimensional data point um, with all these observations. And what we want to understand is whether X is, is a normal point. You can think of it as a baseline. And and then we want to calculate the probability of X being normal. If the probability of something being normal uh, is very close to zero, that means there is some kind of anomaly that needs to be, to be understood. So in, in very simple, if we take a very simple approach on how we test the probability of something being normal, if you think, for example, about um, the mean and the standard deviation, then there will be statistical tools that allow you to, to test the hypothesis of whether something is close to the mean or not. However, we are working in a, in a highly dimensional world, so things are slightly different uh, in terms of how we test this, uh, this assumption of, of, of something being normal. 
And then, of course, we want to understand why something is, is anomalous and, and give as much information as we can to the user uh, so, that he can, uh, so that he can build this confidence that something is really going wrong and where that is happening. So a few lessons learned from this project and um, I'm using here um, a black swan. Um, so I'm, I'm not completely mad. The black swan uh, really uh, talks about the black swan theory from Taleb in the 2000s that say that uh, some events are rare. So they are outliers. And those, those events are the ones that when they happen, they have the most impactful consequences. And, and then the third part of that theory is that after they happen, people uh, try to reason about why they happened, but then it's too late. Um, so, and we have um, an analogy with, with what we are doing here because um, we have unknown failures, those failures which we cannot characterize in advance. Uh, otherwise we would have built a simple model that captures all the possible scenarios that lead to failure. And those unknown failures, they have no labels. Um, so there's no way we can train a model to, to predict those, those black swan events. Um, non failures, uh, the ones that we know about, they have very few labels because uh, machines do not fail that often. So it becomes a, diff a difficult problem for a, for a model. Also, sy systems are very complex. They are all interconnected, uh, multidimensional and multimodal. Um, I remember having a conversation with one of our engineers and he was saying almost everything is a point of failure. Um, and that becomes a big problem in this scenario because everything is connected. Um, also, we have high, if we build a model with high false positive rates, we're sending signals to the operators all the time and they, they won't have time to address all the signals that we are sending them. So they will start ignoring those signals, signals after a while. And one, when one of the signals actually is true and it needs to be properly investigated, um, that will hide the true anomaly and it will not be investigated. And then that trip will happen that, is, that isn't addressed. And of course, the, all the interpretable AI around it. So we need, of course, explanations to, to, to all these steps really, to diagnose, to prioritize and fix the problem. And that's what I'm going to cover now. What is the, the user journey that leads into it? So we start with the anomaly detection. That's when the model is being run. And then we diagnose. We try to bring to bring uh, to come up with the best explanation on why this has happened. And in, and I'll show you in a little bit uh, what type of information we are giving to the users. Uh, severity, um, also, not all the events, not all the anomaly events lead to a trip uh, to the machine actually stopping. Some of them is, uh, might be just that the sensor goes wrong, but that doesn't mean that it will trip the machine. So it's very important to have some sort of red, amber, green system in place that will uh, cl class the, the events in terms of severity. And based on that, then you put priorities in terms of what needs to be repaired or what needs to be uh, active immediately. So that's the treatment that we do, uh, then we recommend, then we verify that the treatment has worked and we go to as a resolution, that's the, the user journey. So the why here is very important. So we use explainable AI to, to understand why the model has reached a certain decision. And when we, we have something which we call a variable attribution, this is really to blame which variables have a greater, a greater influence in the anomaly score so the model is effectively two parts. So we have a neural network, just a glorified set of regressions that gives you a score, gives you probability of a trip. And then you have integrated gradients, which will tell you why this trip that happened and what are the most likely sources of, of, of this trip. Um, we have a collaboration going on on, on interpretable AI with uh, Robert Gordon University to to really help us move this forward and to, for us to be more sophisticated in, type, in the type of interpretation that we are giving to the users. I'll show you what we are doing now and we, what we are plan planning to do next. So to give you an example, taking one machine, uh, I'll give you a couple of, of examples actually. Um, 
here you will see um, the probability of something being normal on the y-axis. So uh, the machine was fairly stable up to this point. And then, and then that probability of being normal uh, drops suddenly. And so there is some, definitely something going, going wrong. We detected that around three hours and 40 minutes before the actual trip here on the, with the red line happens. That will give us enough time to get another machine started before um, other more serious problems uh, happen down the line. Um, so another example, uh, which we detect actually one day before, um, where there, there is a slightly different behavior. I'll, I'll, I'll focus on this one in a little bit in the next slide, because it's not such a sudden drop in, in the, um, in the signal, but it's more a gradual drop, drop that I'll, I'll focus there. And the reason I put these two examples here is that um, these are usually easier to spot when there is a gradual decline. Um, simpler models would be able to capture that, but perhaps not that one when there is a sudden drop. So going a bit into more detail on that, on that example, what you see here is, um, in this case, the temperature of the, of the machine. And you have that this temperature is fairly stable up to a point. And it's still, uh, even though there is a slight change in level, it would be incredibly difficult for, for an operator to, to decide whether there is a trip or not. At least not until that point where there is a decline there that is very, very clear. Um, so what the, what the model actually does is first of all to say, well, 95% of the likelihood of this trip can be attributed to this variable. And then it does something incredibly interesting, which is here we change from temperature to probabilities. And you will see that way before the trip happens um, we, on, that, on that red line there, the model is already being very noisy in terms of the space of probabilities. So you can see that that is almost like this amplification effect from the signal that you are getting from the sensor offshore to uh, the space of probabilities. And this is, I think, the most important thing because based on this, we can straight away um, raise an alarm and the technician can go and check whether something is wrong. And effectively, there was something wrong. Um, so, and, and we did that one day before. We managed to detect that one day before. So, we tested this on a pilot of, of two machines initially, and all the trip events that happened uh, in the last two years were detected successfully by the model with different timelines, some one day before, some 15 minutes, some one hour before. So an important part of this that we always keep in mind is that we don't do this blindly, uh, meaning we don't leave all the effort to the machine. We then cross-check this against uh, against an engineering study. So we, we sit with the process engineer and we try to understand if this actually makes sense, if the predictions are robust and if the timelines where the trips are being detected make sense from a process engineering perspective. So, and, and, and this is exactly what we are doing here. So you have, uh, you have a, 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 the trends that the process engineer gets from, from, from our system. And, and we always match the, those, those records against what the model is predicting. So in terms of uh, the process that we, kind of a high level process of model building. So we of course use historical data. We take usually two years of data, sometimes a little bit more depending on the machine and the signal that is there. And we take, almost everything we can find about that machine. And that doesn't mean we are going to end up using all the, all the information that we have. And, and this is the key step. There is an automatic data labeling process, which I'll cover in a little bit. But I want to make this point really clear. We are not training a supervised model against known trips. We are just sending a space of features. Uh, and then based on that, we generate the labels um, using called uh, something called negative sampling. Um, I won't be able to go into a lot of detail on that. I'm happy to answer questions and then perhaps take it offline. 
And then based on this automatic labeling process, then everything becomes easy. This is a key step because then based on that, it's just training a model. And here you could train almost any model you want as long as the model um, considers interactions between features. That's that's a key component. We, we chose uh, a neural network. Um, it worked better for us than other types of classifiers. And I'll cover that in a little bit, but it's, it's a neural network. And this type of methodology was inspired by, by Google's. Thankfully, they published and they're open, they open sourced their code and they published a paper on this. So they used exactly the same approach um, on 145 buildings in the California Bay Area. And the problem was very similar. So they have sensors on the buildings capturing temperatures, humidities, and so on. And, and they started with a pilot like we did. And, and now they, they deploy this at scale. So massively success, successful. Also, the good thing about all this is that training the models is really fast. So uh, we never had any, any issues with that. So once you build the models, then of course uh, the models have to be deployed and I'll give you a bit of an insight of on the architecture that we are using for that. We use Azure, but of course you could use GCP or you can use uh, AWS, anything you want, it will be the same. Um, then we collect data live uh, every 10 minutes from an internal system that we have called Pi. Um, that calculates the probability of having an anomaly on the system. And then we are building a front end uh, that will show uh, the results to the user. So we'll have a trends for all the rotating equipments in the front end page. And um, also if there is a probability of actually having a trip, um, there are three things happening. One is we are recording the results to the database, of course. We are sending an email uh, to a control room and we are also raising a notification on the front end tool. And this front end tool is, is permanently displayed in this control room. So these things can be active immediately. So a bit on the neural network architecture that we are using. Um, it, it looks a bit complicated, but it's not that complicated. Uh, so we start, I took an example of one of the initial models that we have that starts with seven variables there on top. So this is just a one dimensional vector with cell, seven elements in, in this vector. That's how we start. So it's a flat vector. Um, some machines, some more recent models have many more variables than this, but this is better, a better one to, for the example, really. Then you have, uh, then you have these blue circles. So these are the neurons on the, on the neural network. We have 150 on each layer, which is quite a, a large amount of neurons that we have. We are just showing a sample of those neurons there just because of space. All this, this layer is fully connected and these are also fully connected to the, to the other layers. The reason is just for the sake of visualization that we are not showing everything. Perhaps the key point is these orange circles here, which are the dropout layers. So if we didn't have those dropout layers there, the model will just start memorizing the training data uh, and potentially overfitting. So we drop out some variables, some, some data at each of those, between each of those layers so that we avoid that. So it's the same thing as, as almost like hiding information from, from a child before she takes the exam paper so that she does not uh, memorize the questions and the answers. Um, so the red circle is then, of course, how we then convert all these all these uh, regressions and interactions into a single number. And this is the probability of a trip. So it it starts simple, gets more complicated, and and then it becomes simple again at the end. Um, I'll probably come back. Yeah, I'll just cover a little bit on this on this slide um, because this this one has way too much text to be a slide. But um, just want to raise one one point, which is this this concentration phenomenon. That that's the thing that drives everything. Um, I'll, I'll I will be available for questions on that. It it gets rather technical, but uh, it it has to do with uh, with negative sampling, and this is the key key step on the on the. Um, on the algorithm that we followed. It was inspired by uh, computer virus detection, which is very interesting. And, and it's the process I was describing before is how we go from 
a data set that um, has no labels or very few, so few that you can actually ignore because it would be worse to include them. And now we build this label data set automatically from, from, from the training data. A bit on the technical architecture, again, a bit of a complex diagram. I'll just cover um, one or two parts on it. The first one is how we build the models. So I'll probably recognize that, that, that in there. So we use Databricks for that, just because some of the bigger models are, are computationally more expensive and we need, we need some computing power for that. But we are going quite conservative in terms of how we deploy the models, meaning that from the point we get it out of data, we actually get it out of Databricks, we put it in a ripple so that we can actually uh, source control those files. So we are not doing any, any sort of online training. Um, and uh, if we need to retrain the models, we'll be looking at the performance metrics over time. If we need it, we repeat this process that is for now. And then perhaps from all this diagram, the key step is I think is in here. So we have an Azure data factory that manages the, the predictions. What this means is that every 10 minutes, we get a prediction. Uh, so we, we send an HTTP request to, uh, to an Azure function. And that is your function runs the actual, gets the data from the database, runs the prediction and, uh, and does a couple of things. One of it, it puts, it puts into a database, which becomes then our, our history of predictions, uh, but also sends a pop-up notification and an email notification if there is a prediction. So yeah, I think I'll, I'll move on from that side because it's a bit scary. Um, it's probably one of the most exciting things coming. Um, so Jen Wee Yang is, is another data scientist on the team. And so he came up, he, had, he came up as an answer to a question that we that we had during the during the building of these models. Um, he started investigating a bit further and and he found a, another algorithm that could uh, work together with neural networks. To, to give a better uh, balance on the predictions. Uh, so to really address this issue of model bias. Um, so uh, for now it's called high performance clustering. I cannot say much about it because it's, it's actually going to register a patent for that, which I'm really proud about. Uh, but one of the plans for this is to take the neural network predictions, the ones I've been talking about, and then to merge that with this, the predictions from this new algorithm and then combine them with a meta learner and get a combined prediction. So this is something that is that is coming coming soon. Apologies for not giving more details on that. So it's kind of a summary of what's what's happening, what has been happening. So we took inspiration, as I said, from the smart buildings at Google. We we built seven, eight models for one of the platforms called the Algin Franklin. Um, this is being scaled. Okay, I was too fast with my fingers, apologies. So this is now being scaled to Klein and Elsa. So, and the plan is to have um, a dashboard, uh, which is gonna call it a digital heat map that collects the, all the predictions for all the rotating equipments that we have uh, from all the platforms. And then, and then this is, this is uh, kind of, I know it's very small, but it's a wireframe of how it's going to look like. So we are going to have trends for each machine where the users can actually go into more detail, check when it was the last trip, what is the current probability of a trip, uh, but also they will have an overview of the plant and, and what may be happening and what needs attention uh, and, and, and the priorities around that. So to finish, I um, just wanted to cover a bit on the, on the change management side, which is no, no least important than, than the, anything else we, we, we've said is actually really important. So I'm borrowing many of these ideas from uh, Melanie Franklin. So our, our Scrum Master uh, did, a, did a course on, on, on change management. And, and there's some great material out of this that I wanted that selected to, to cover here. First of all, digital transformations are very difficult. Um, most of them actually fail and they fail not because of resources or budget or anything else. 
It's all about behaviors and mindsets. And it comes both from the employees resisting to change and also the management behavior that is not supporting that change. Um, so how do we change that? Um, so this is again a term uh, that was coined by Melanie Franklin, agile change. So agile change is bringing the best principles from uh, agile techniques and the best principles from change management and applying the two together. And what this means is, is, and I think the key point here is this chart, which I really love, which is you, you have this period of, of uh, reduced productivity in the beginning. Uh, so regardless of those project activities that they, they will happen over time, but that needs to come together with a behavioral change and where people are trying new ways of working, they are understanding how to do things, creating new habits. So there is this initial uh, productivity loss here where the acceptance is low. Uh, but once you get through that, then the benefits over time, they will start to realize. And, and, and so I think the key point here is really to find this sweet spot between those tangible things that we are building, you know, we are putting in place new systems, new processes, locations, uh, all sorts of things are giving new tooling that people need to learn. Um, and, and we are also trying to change the method, the way people actually deal with those things, how they work with the tools that we are giving them and changing those mindsets. So it's, it's really finding this sweet spot between the project activities and the change activities. And this, and this is where our, our Scrum Masters are, are, are the, key, the key piece in all this and uh, also the product owners, um, yes. So this is, um, the material I have for today. So thanks, thank you very much for, for listening and I hope you have questions. There are questions, Pedro, thank you very much. Uh, that was that was brilliant. And I was, I was saying to you yesterday, I was like, yeah, I'll be listening and I'll be, I'll be, and I was like, most of that was just like, flew right over my head. However, it didn't fly over the heads of our audience and we have a number of questions for you, sir. So I'm conscious of time. And obviously, with that hard stop on one, I am going to crack right on with first question from George. George, thank you so much. Pedro, how do you extract features from rotating machinery, SCADA or Vibration 2? If Vibration 2, a lot of signal methods tend to rely on human inspection of results to evaluate how good filter selection is. So how do you automate, for example, envelope analysis for bearings? So it's all around extracting features from rotating machinery. Yes, uh, well, it is a very complex question and a very good one. Um, so thankfully we have a good system in place, it's called PI, uh, it's, it's used across uh, the oil and gas industry. And a lot of his data is already being captured for us. Um, and we are streaming this data in, into our databases um, every 30 seconds. Um, so sometimes, the quality of this data is not the best. Uh, and of course we want to improve on that. So there is a big effort um, to start doing IoT where there are gaps in the data. Um, so I think it will just get better over time. Um, but with the data we have, which is to be honest from all the industries I've worked before, it here it's extremely, extremely rich. We have a lot of data. Uh, so we have more issues with having too much data than too little. Um, so there are, of course, as I said, certain gaps we need to, to plug into and cover, like, and, and perhaps just with IoT, we're going to get some, some, something around that. Um, I can think about emissions data, for example. Uh, if you think certain emissions data will be uh, easier to capture with IoT devices. Um, so... But yes, we, we have a lot of data. We are, we are very, I mean, as data scientists, we are in the best place in the world, I, I would say. Okay, thank you, Pedro. Another question here from Chris. Chris, thank you for your question, fella. How many classes are there in the anomaly detection model? Is it just normal to abnormal or are you trying to detect different operating modes? It's um, no, it's a very good question because I've been thinking about operating modes for months um, and we, we start with normal and abnormal, but then 
uh, that is converted into a probability. Uh, so we have this spectrum of probabilities, which is more useful than just to say it's normal or not. So um, operating modes is a very interesting question. I think that we could use that on the explainability of the predictions. And I would love to do that, which is to say, um, even when, so when something is normal, is it, it's quite easy to, to start characterizing what, what are the normal operating modes. Maybe there are two or three different envelopes that we can put those. If something becomes abnormal, uh, I'm hoping that with this research that we have ongoing with, uh, with Robert Gordon University on explainable AI, we can start walking towards that direction and we can say, we can start bucketing things like almost like operating modes of anomalies, like all these, like if we can map those, those, those sensors that start going wrong into something that we can characterize, oh, this is, let's say, the low oil system that is failing, or this is another system that is failing, and this, is, this causes this trickle-down effect. That will be amazing. So very good question. Thank you. I'm just going to jump in with my own because I'd actually been scrolling stuff away there. And you mentioned Robert Gordon earlier on, and, and I know Professor E. Adelan up there, and, and him and I have been kind of folks for years. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how important is that collaboration? So you, you've got you've got almost like little sub teams that are working on on site projects. You mentioned your colleague there that the patent is pending and all that kind of stuff. Could you explain how that model works between between industry, academia, and how the balance is? Uh, yes, I mean. Um... Many times, uh, well, in this particular case, um, they have already an ongoing project on explainable AI, mm -hmm. and they try to collaborate with differ different industries so they can actually validate their approach with different with data from different sectors. Uh, so for them, there is a big advantage to do to get these validations so their model uh, becomes agnostic to the industry. Right. Yep. And for us, it, it's a big advantage because we are a small team. So um, that helps us with the research side, which sometimes because we work in sprints in an agile manner, we don't really have time to do a lot of research. It helps because then the result of the research can be incorporated into our tooling. Brilliant. Yes, that makes perfect sense. Classic example of collaboration between academia and industry. My cat's just come into the room. Hello, cat. Uh, moving on here. So... Thank you very much for that, Chris. We've got a question here from Matteo. How do you manage the monitoring of many related signals? Um, right. Um, so we have, uh, so, so the fact that we are using a neural, a neural network to start with, um, it's, it's not by mistake. Uh, so there are two parts. That's a bit we do in terms of how we select the features we want into the model. Uh, there's no point of having features that are highly correlated in the same model. Um, so we do a bit of feature selection in the beginning to, to exclude those features that are, that are correlated with each other. Um, and in terms of features that are correlated because they interact with each other, we, we need that, we need that. One of the key points of this modeling approach with, with a negative sampling followed for, by a neural network is that many times the signals of individual variables is absolutely normal, which, every, which of course is expected, but most of the space when looked in isolation variable by variable is normal, but we, the fact that we have a fairly complex neural network is not by mistake and I usually don't like complicated models. I prefer something that 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 is simpler, or more parsimonious that we can control. But we are putting a complicated model on top because we really need to capture the interactions. The interactions here are the key, um, and that's and that's how we we really uh, monitor these two types of correlations, if you want correlations and interactions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matteo. Charlotte, Charlotte, how are you doing? Question from Charlotte Pedro. Hi, Pedro. Did you find any issues with explainability of the neural network to the business in terms of them being able to understand how the model determined the output? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a great question, that Charlotte. That's the change management point that you kind of yes. Yes, okay, okay. Yes. So... 
our work, I think we call it workbook. Our workbook with RGU has something that has the words uh, model explanations from the users to the users. So what we are trying to do is to build, not to, to apply some fancy technique and then give to the users and then they, under, they don't understand it. And we try to almost like impose those explanations onto them, um, like, like all the famous kind of uh, explanations that are out there, like sharp values and things like that. For us, data scientists perhaps is not that difficult, but for a user, it is very difficult to understand. So we have that in mind in the change management that we have to build, we have to have them integrated in the process and, and they need to tell us what they want to see. Is it, is it as simple as if I change this variable by X percent, uh, does my outcome change by Y percent? Uh, is it that, or is something even simpler? Is what we are giving them right now like the top three variables that are more likely to cause a trip, is that enough? If that's enough, job done, they like that because then they can allocate a work order to check that sensor. So I would say the users in at the center and also getting involved in the model building to me is, is the key. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Good to hear from you. Uh, another question from George, Pedro. For explainability when passing outputs to engineers, what are you using? SHAP or something else? We decided not to use SHAP values because um, they are difficult to, to explain. So for now, the only thing we give them is a ranked list of variables, the ones I was showing on the slides. And we say 90% of the blame for this trip is because of temperature or pressure. Um, that's the initial step. The next step is to decide, okay, what can we add to that? Of course, we would like to have a normal, like a scatter chart where we say this variable affects the outcome in this way. Um, but that, that's next step for us. So we are building and scaling all these models and explainability will walk with us along the way and we'll get better at doing so. But I'm, I'm uh, sharp values uh, has been more a tool for ourselves, data scientists, because it's difficult to translate sharp values into business metric. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Makes sense. And, and it's sharp. I said S H A P. I've learned it's sharp. <laughs> Thanks very much for that, George. Question here from Mackenzie Pedro. Mackenzie asks In the example you gave of the anomaly with the gradual decline, is there a way you could leverage against the variance of the probability prediction for an anomaly against a good precision value, given your need to avoid false positives? Wow, that's a big one. Mackenzie <laughs> <laughs> uh, is probably sitting next to me, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's putting you on the spot. Um, so, first of all, um, the, the way we the way we, we optimize for false positives, I think that's the key point here is the false positives because it's a big concern. Um, the way we optimize for false positives comes that comes back to the negative sampling part of it. So there's something called the sample ratio that we need to optimize. And it's a very clear relationship that the way we sample the data, the way we do negative sampling with a sample ratio will have almost a direct relationship to the number of false positives. So I don't see that as much as related um, to having a gradual decline or a sudden decline. Um, what we found in this research, and this is quite recent to be honest. I mean, Google has published this paper in 2020, which for research is, is a baby. So, um, and we, what we found is that Tweaking this ratio is the tool that we need to control for false positives. Um, and, and that works well across sudden drops and gradual drops. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you for your question. Pedro, thank you for the answer. I'm just checking time here. We'll get about another 14 minutes and we've got a whole bundle of questions to get wow. through. You stay where you are, Pedro. Thank you, Mackenzie. <laughs> Chris has popped up. If there's time to ask, Chris, there is time to ask. Are your models all ANN and regression based anomaly detectors? How do you select clean baseline data sets? Is it done manually? Uh, 
yes, they are all neural networks, yes. Um, and we found that um, the architecture we have is working quite well across different uh, machines. The only thing we need to do, of course, is to optimize the, the parameters of the model as we move to different machines. It was a key requirement to be able to scale these things quite quickly. Uh, uh, so it's it's an advantage for us if we have a model uh, that keeps roughly the same architecture across. And we actually need that, that complexity in this case. Um, and the second part of the question, sorry, what was that? Hold Apologies. On. I need to go back, I need to go back, hold on. Uh, right, are, are your models all ANN regression based? So that's neural network regression based anomaly detectors. How do you select clean baseline data sets? Is this done manually? No, it's all automated. Um, so I would say the difficult part is to select how much data we need to start with uh, so that we can get this baseline right. But the baseline is not selected manually. It's the negative sampling that, that does that based on the sample ratio. Um, and, and again, I keep emphasizing this and must be, that must be really tedious, but this, the, the negative sampling is the key in all this. Uh, like uh, the model itself, I could fit a different model as long as it is, as it, as it captures some interactions and it has some, uh, some complexity into it. We cannot fit, if I fit a linear regression to this or not a linear regression, but a logistic regression or something simpler, I'm 95% sure it's not going to capture the signals I need because it's, it will probably miss some interactions. Um, yeah, so so I think, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I hope it answers the question too. Thank you very much. Um, next question from Alan. And Alan, we're going to be coming back to you just towards the end, so don't go away. Alan says, super interesting. Thanks, Pedro. I'm interested in the operational aspects. It sounds like you have successfully pro proved this approach works over time in production. And I'm curious if the business view around explainability has changed. For example, has it become more or less important? It's, thanks, Alan. Um, that's a good question. It's difficult to say right now uh, because um, we are doing the long run here. What I mean is we are working with a few key users for now, very, showing the, the variable attributions, showing the ranked variables that lead to a trip. For now, it's enough for them. This is a journey we are doing with them as we develop the models and the front end tools. Um, so I think the adoption will depend on, as I said before, on having them on board during all this and building that trust with them. Um, like when I deploy a model, I'm not expecting the users to, to give me immediate feedback uh, for many reasons. Um, first of it, it needs to sink in. They need to understand what the model is doing, what are those predictions that they are seeing on the screen and the attributions, how are these things changing over time? I would give it at least six months or a year for these things to, to really be part of their ways of working. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have to work on them with them um, as, as we go along really. So it's early to say. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for the question, Alan. Next question from Matteo. Matteo says, thank you. Can you talk some more about the negative sampling algorithm for automatic labeling? Yes, absolutely. Um, yes. So the negative sampling works. Uh, so it all derives from this concentration phenomenon, which is, going to, which is, which is a very, very interesting thing that goes into, into uh, multidimensional probabilities. The best way I have to explain it, because it gets into, it gets rather technical very quickly, is imagine a cube um, and think about the extremities of the cube. So the, the lines that connect each, each face of the cube. And then think of um, looking at those extremities as all well, the extreme points, uh, and then adding a small delta on each side so that you almost come outside of the cube a little bit, okay? So you are building a space that is not anymore contained within the cube. Think about that and then 
think about generating a uniform sample out of this. And what's going to happen is that if you compare your historical data with this uniform data that uniformly sampled data from this cube with a bit more on top of it, with a bit that goes over the edges, if you compare the two, surprisingly, perhaps, the distributions are very similar. And this is what I was saying that when you look at things in isolation, they will look normal. But when you apply this principle and you start doing this labeling and you apply a neural network on top of it, what becomes important is not the variables itself, it's the interaction of them. Um, that's the key point on, on all this. I'll be really happy if you connect with me and we discuss it in more detail because uh, I, I love this stuff, but I'll probably need a whiteboard. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you very much, Matteo. Thank you, Pedro. Final question before we bring things to a close for today. Uh, Alistair, thank you for your question. Is the algorithm based on the instantaneous state of the system now, or does it take account of the recent previous state, for example, trends? Amazing question. No, it's all based on spot values. Um, yes. Um, I'll have, I would love to have an autoregressive component. It will cause all sorts of complications in terms of the design. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it's all based on spot values is what's happening right now. But it's an amazing question and perhaps a point for development. <laughs> Oh, I think there's another, somebody's just jumped in with another final sneaky question. Oh, here we go. No, it's not really a question, it's just a request. George, thank you so much for today. Any chance that you could post the reference to the Google paper you mentioned in the chat or share the presentation? The presentation absolutely will be shared, George. Uh, that will come up in a couple of days on the MBN website and other places, I would imagine. Um, I was going to ask you, Pedro, if you're happy for people to, I know that you're on LinkedIn. Are you happy for people to connect with you directly on LinkedIn? And Absolutely. Maybe with the, so there you go, Pedro. You, you'll find Pedro on LinkedIn. It's not hard to find them. Um, I'm going to bring things to a close here, guys. Firstly, to, to say a massive thank you to Pedro. Pedro, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Thanks for sharing your enthusiasm. Thanks for sharing with the community, mate. It really is appreciated. Thank you to everybody who's taken time out of their day today. Um, thanks for all your questions. Thanks for all your interest and enthusiasm in the work that Pedro's doing. Folks, it is appreciated, and that's what this is all about. I mentioned Alan Stevenson earlier on. Um, our next meetup will be just over a month from now. It's on April the 28th, and it's going to be a special one because we are hoping, we're hoping, world events notwithstanding, we're hoping that for the first time in well over a couple of years, we might be able to do an in-the-flesh meetup. So what we're planning to do Thursday, April the 28th in Glasgow, in the MBN Solutions office in Glasgow. Alan Stevenson's going to be talking about supercharging your machine learning workflows with some robust tools. More importantly, there's going to be a competition. And even more importantly, there's going to be some swag. So Alan works for a company called Weights and Biases. And uh, uh, Paul, not sure, not sure at the moment. It may be, but not sure. It might just be an in-the-flesh one. Um, but uh, sorry, Alan works for Weights and Biases. He's, he's going to come along, give a talk. Glasgow is the place to be for that evening. Fingers crossed we can do it. Um, obviously, if there's further things happening in the world, we might not be able to do it, but hopefully we can do it. And it will be so good to get back out on the road again because we used to do this up in Aberdeen and everywhere. Well, we'll see how things go. Listen, that is it from me. Pedro, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. It's been amazing. Everybody on the chat, thank you all so very much. Look forward to I will be coming back to Aberdeen soon, Charlotte. <laughs> trust me. And the swag will be there. Thanks again, folks. Take care. Have a great rest of your day. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.